Show again. <laughs> well, uh, oh, let's God. let's see if we can work this out by deduction. Let's start with let's start with figuring out some of the things that it isn't. Um, it's not. I don't think this is beyond the breakers. No, no, because no, we were no. talking about that in a sort of like a third person context, like right. Mm-hmm. Yes, because we were asking Tanner questions about Beyond the Breakers mm-hmm. as though we didn't know what was on that show, which makes me think that mm-hmm. that's not our show. Right. Our show, famously the one that we know exactly what's on it and what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Um. Is this is this uh, the nutrition podcast corn under lunches? That is. Oh, that's what it is. It's the one where we talk about roughage and how it's important for scraping out your intestines. That's what my dad told me when I was a kid. I'm sure that's still true. Why is it going under your lunch, though? Well, it's kind of like when you you have to put medication in like a bit of peanut butter, a piece of cheese to give a dog. That, so you're putting a good lunch over the, the corn. The thing so about, that, uh, <laughs> the, the thing about the, the roughage and cleaning out your intestines reminds me of, I remember learning about how oatmeal was good for your heart. And I want to say it was like my grandmother or something who was like, yeah, because of the shape of the oats, it like cleans out your arteries. And like growing up, I was like, I don't think that's where the food goes. <laughs> Like, good, good Christ, if I have oatmeal like, in my arteries, I think I have big, really big goddamn problems. The, you, you go to the doctor and he's like, you know, OK, glad to see you've been eating your oatmeal like I recommended. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, have we tried putting oatmeal in in an IV because it's nutritious? So you want it there mm-hmm. anyway. It's abrasive, yeah, yeah. so it's going to clean out your arteries. And it would probably kind of feel tingly and cool. You could just use like a pipe cleaner or something. <laughs> yeah, Same just feed thing. The, just feed that into your veins. It'll be fine. <laughs> I mean, that that's not that far off from what, oh, I can't remember the name of the procedure. It's one of the ones where they basically just like physically knock out the, the Sorry, plaque could you do that? in your arteries. Could you do that in hand motion again? How do they? Yeah, so basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the a, it's a, it's a heart surgery motion. Yeah, of course. So basically, the do- yeah, the doctor gets right up in your business and he starts going like this, and he's just kind of like <laughs> clean you out. Yeah, cleaning out the pipes, if you will. Mm. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing that anybody listening to this in audio format is going to miss out on. <laughs> that's why you always got to watch the show visually. They're, they're going to imagine that classic like artery cleaning motion, and they're like, "Well, there's nothing funny about that at all." So. <laughs> What's the classic artery cleaning yeah, motion? I'm look, look oh, I mean, we all know well. it. I, we it don't like even the- have to. Is it? No, the, I yeah, think that's perfect. Is it like sign language though? How that's different from country to country? Is the artery cleaning motion different in the states? Than in Canada? <laughs> we can only so assume. Anyway, so anyway, Nicole, you were introducing the show, I believe. <laughs> yeah. So I think the show is actually called "Born Under Punches," um, which is less fun. Um, and I. Uh, Initially, I was going to ask about like what content everyone's listening to, but now I kind of weird want to hear about what weird nutrition things you learned from your family when you were younger. Oh man, uh, I mean Did the ginger anyone... ale thing. The and ginger we're, ale and of course, we're not going to say one. our names or anything. No, no, sorry, definitely, sorry. definitely not the entire point <laughs> I... of why we added the intro. <laughs> uh, nobody, I am nobody, the... nobody gives a fuck what our names are, Kelly. Yeah. Come on. I am the uh, prestigious storyteller, Josh. And uh, it was always a ginger ale thing for us whenever we got the flu. And I think I've like basically just at, at this point, it's a placebo effect. If I get the flu or just don't feel good in the in the stomach, I get ginger ale. I'm like, well, it's technically got ginger in it, I guess. <laughs> if you get the Canada dry, it's, it's flavored with real ginger. According yeah, to the so bottle, I mean, so. so naturally it would make my it make my stomach stop hurting. And so that's you'd almost hope because like we didn't get a lot of soda when we were kids because pop costs money. And uh, so you're almost hoping every so often, like once a year, you'd be like, I really hope I get the flu because then I get I can get mom to buy me a bottle of ginger ale. Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, it, to be fair, the day that I was at your house that I couldn't eat anything until 3 p.m., I drank water 
threw it up, and then immediately five minutes later drank ginger ale and, it's, and held it down. So Yeah, exactly. Science? Right? Is anecdotal science. evidence science? I have yeah. a question, a language question here. What is the what is the pop soda distribution like in Canada? Is that is I mean I, I, like I the words pretty, themselves? Like who says pop and who says soda? Uh, I use soda them pretty is, interchangeably. Soda's the word that tells people that you should be stuffed into a locker. Okay. <laughs> that's gotcha. I think that's kind of like because, national. Because I always grew up saying pop when I was a kid. And then like we live different places and different places use different ones, but it's there's no real rhyme or reason here. But then like once I started teaching and like working with international students, I started defaulting to saying soda because like they didn't know what the fuck pop was. And so like I would have to use this word that they actually knew um, the same way I started using the word sofa instead of couch because they didn't know what a couch was. So, yeah, sodas and sofas. Yeah, anyway. I don't know. I Yeah, I don't know. We I, I've always used them pretty interchangeably. Sometimes I say soda, sometimes I say pop. But I've also got that, a lot that, of international friends, so like yeah. I don't know if I just like subconsciously adjust on the fly. But I was going to pop. say, I was going to say that I thought that pop was kind of like a universal thing in Canada, but then I also remembered the. I was just talking about this like last week, the worst song of all time, which is of course, uh, "Go for a Soda" by Kim Mitchell. Oh yeah, and I mean that's a that's a Canadian artist singing about soda, but maybe he's also trying to appeal to American audiences or maybe he just mm-hmm. needed a two syllable word because you're like might as well go for a pop it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah maybe he just thought that America had a bigger problem with drinking and driving and that was that was really who he thought he should aim his message at I mean drinking and driving is a problem so but I don't I don't want to give Kid Mitchell any credit I'm mad just that I had to think of him again <laughs> <laughs> why do you hate him so much he's the fucking worst he's Canadian Steve Miller only worse what the fuck's problem do you have with Steve Miller? Have you I listened to any of his songs or read his lyrics? I didn't know who this person was, and now I don't want to, that you've described him that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know who you Remember when Steve Miller are. rhymes, uh, what was it, like, Texas with what the facts is? <laughs> and, yeah, you mean the best, most creative rhyme of all time? <laughs> yeah, because the only way Steve Miller can actually rhyme is when he just, like, lists off a bunch of cities. Oh my god! I hate Steve Miller so much. I'm, you've made me forget how angry I am at technology, and now I'm just thinking about how mad I, how much I hate Steve Miller and Kim Mitchell. So is this like the whole thing? Like you smash your hand when you stub your toe, so that you think about the pain in your hand instead of your toe? Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Ah, perfect. That's my entire job on the show is just to distract Kelly from whatever he's mad at at the moment, so that he yeah. doesn't fixate on it. And now that you've said your job on the show, do you want to say what your name is? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, my name is Nicole, um, and I'm a Kelly Wrangler. Mm-hmm. And the weirdest nutrition fact I ever got was, God, I've got way too many. My family's all into weird witchy shit. That is true. Did you know that if you put stickers of nice words on your container that holds your water it will infuse the water with those vibes well damn i just gotta stop putting fucking you piece of shit on my water bottle every time i drink it then it's probably doing the reverse there's your problem (laughs) oh my god everyone throw your counseling out the window (laughs) yeah so i'm kelly and my job on the show is that uh i'm i'm sort of a hungry ghost doomed to walk the earth being plagued by every possible issue with technology. I think I I think I did something bad to technology in a, la, a past life. So this is why this is just sort of like my karmic spot in the wheel is just to be plagued by everything that can go wrong with any any device that really has I'm going to say uses electricity. How much of a past life? Like was this like trebuchets or are we talking like you know, the 1980s and like the internet was just starting to be a thing? See, I don't know because I'm not the one who's aware of my past life. So this is why I'm this is why I'm mad. I'm also mad at the whole karma system because like why am I getting punished for a thing I can't remember? Like you can't men in black mind white me and then put me in jail because it just doesn't make sense. Wait, so are you an advocate for if you get blackout drunk and you do something shitty, you're not culpable for that thing? Oh, a hundred percent. Thinking about <laughs> the stuff I've done while blackout drunk, a hundred percent. Hmm. 
there's a good uh, there there's a good discussion question. What's the what's the craziest thing that you've found out after the fact that you did while blackout drunk? Mm-hmm. You can Ooh. answer that question if you want. You don't have to have to answer my shitty question about nutrition. I have a good answer, and I'll I'll say that I already did with the oatmeal in the in the veins thing. But um, um, the weirdest slash worst thing I ever did while blackout drunk was or one. This was like freshman year. I was home visiting from college. Me and my brother were drinking in the basement and um, I drank a shit ton of we were drinking. Um, what's it called? Admiral Nelson and UV red. I don't know what any of those words mean. Yeah. Admiral Nelson is cheap uh, spice rum. It's like, are you familiar with uh, Captain Morgan? Oh, is she? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Despite his higher rank, Admiral Nelson is far inferior <laughs> to, to Captain Morgan. Um, uh, so I was drinking a lot of that. And then UV red, like the I don't even think it's technically vodka. It's like flavored vodka liqueur. Um, mm. And it's and it's uh, like red raspberry flavored. Awful stuff. Um, anyway, I was drinking a shit ton of that. And. <clears throat> The next morning I wake up and my brother is just like standing over me. He's like shaking me awake and he's like, hey, get up. I had like, first of all, I had like vomited in the corner of my room and he's like, hey, do you know that book that you have about revolutions in Latin America from the 19th century? (laughs) And I was like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, you threw up inside of it. Inside of it? Uh-huh. What do you mean yeah. inside of it? Like, I don't know. I guess I guess like my you had instinct it, like, hollowed out like you would hide a gun in there, but you I like... guess my, it's my vomit uh my vomitorium. Um <laughs> and I guess I don't know, again, I don't know what I was thinking, but my my first thought must have been, oh, I don't want to throw up on the carpet or the bed. So I'm gonna throw up in this. <laughs> It was basically it was kind of like a like a textbook size thing. Um, and so, yeah, that got thrown out, unfortunately. Um, mm. but, Gee, that uh, would have been a good book. Yeah, I know. I've never thought to uh, reacquire it just because, you know, the memories are too. You know. uh, mm-hmm. But anyway, that's that. My takeaway from that story is I'm very mad that the UV vodka red flavor isn't called infrared. That'd be good. Yeah, that's um, fucked up. They that's completely backwards. There is a there is a UV um birthday cake flavor. Oh um, boy. Yeah, that is that is uh it's awful stuff. It's it's absolutely rancid. Um but it exists. Um it's been a long time since I've drank any of that fine selection of of uh of alcohols. But mm-hmm. it reminds me of the sourpuss is what that sounds like. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the at the risk of further delaying the the intended uh, segment we were going to do, uh, I didn't give my nutrition answer, and the only one that came to me was the somebody told me, or maybe this is just online. I might have looked it up, but I was when I was pretty young and needing to pass like my first ever drug test for work. And when I was, yeah, 19 or whatever, I was like dabbling heavily in or I was dabbling in smoking weed. So I think I was sort of on that borderline for whether I should pass. I don't know. But anyway, I did what any, you know, 19 year old would do and just try every single like folk remedy for detoxing. And I remember that one of them was like chugging. Is it cranberry juice? Does that sound right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So I was just, and I was living with my parents. And so I was trying to do this really slyly. Maybe I just wait till they left the (laughs) house. But I just like was in the basement and they had an exercise bike down there. And so I would chug cranberry juice and I put on like heavy, like, like wool, like, uh, like sweats, uh, jacket, like winter jacket, whatever. And this is like spring. And got on the exercise bike and just chugged for as long as I could, uh, just to try to generate maximum <laughs> sweat and just like dripping. Oh, boy. it was gross. I did pass the test, so clearly it worked. <laughs> <laughs> 
But I, I'm pretty sure it's also false. I don't think cranberry juice will do fuck all for your also, weed levels. Any company that requires a fucking piss test is a piece of shit. Fuck you. <laughs> that's yeah, that's fair. Ah. Yeah, I mean this is back when it was not legal, which you can kind of get the logic. The fact no. that fuck them still kind of have to do it now, but it's it's objectively dumber now. Yeah. Like have you have you smoked weed in the past month? Like, well, hmm. That's none of your fucking business. <laughs> also, man, <laughs> I'm not high now. A lot of people you deal with on a regular basis have some sort of substance in their body to get through the fucking day. I'm not gonna lie. That cashier might be high. <laughs> that line cook probably drunk. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I uh, not me. I'm high on life, but oh yeah, sure. If I was, if I had to work <laughs> in the service industry again, good Fuck, lord, I was drunk during the service industry. Quite I a remember. Bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Quick little pivot to sincerity hour. Um, so glad we got all our dick jokes out now. There couldn't possibly be any that we. Hey, I thought I was I being pretty him. I was being pretty fucking sincere when I told you about throwing up in a textbook. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. So like do you just make these on the regular? question about the theme <laughs> yeah um well i have many i guess but i have one specifically about the words was that did it say i forget what it was the capacity was it saying the word earnest or was it saying the word honest in the weird baby voice uh it was saying that uh i can't help but be earnest earnest okay i believe okay. the i believe the lyrics to that song are i'm the sincerity baby wah <laughs> I have, I can't help, I'm just a baby, I can't help but be earnest, wah. And I haven't yet, de- I haven't yet developed the neurological capacity for irony, wah. I feel like by making that theme song, though, you're showing that we do have the capacity for irony, because I feel like that's very ironic. Well, I'm being ironic playing a sincere character. <laughs> and it it's not a violation of the rules because the sincerity hour starts when the song ends. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Mm. Is the sincerity baby's name Ernest? Could be, yeah. <laughs> the importance of being earnest. Yeah, see, when we're done with the the robot voice game, we can do a game where I play a character called Ernest the Sincerity Baby. And <laughs> instead of the robot voice modulator, I will just use the baby voice modulator. Jesus Christ. Please, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one would be real fucking bad for an hour. All right. Let's do some Sincerity Hour shit. Um, so I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about like cozy and cottage core things. Is everyone, everyone familiar with those concepts? Kelly already hates my question. <laughs> he hates no. it so much. He doesn't even, you can leave. I wish no. to return to the woods. Is cottage core just like. Now I should remind you before you finish the sentence that there are no bits allowed during the sincerity hour and we have started. I was going to ask, is, is cottage core just like wearing cozy stuff and I don't know what else, what else is that? What is, what does it entail? Yeah. So it's like, I guess it's kind of like in a, like a thing online right now. It's like an aesthetic where it's like, imagine the, like the vibe of living in a cottage in the woods and you're like, the sun is streaming through the trees and you have a garden that you go and tend and there's wildflowers everywhere and there's like bunnies hopping through it and you're like reading a book in your garden swing and um yeah just like that kind of vibe um and so i like guess i i feel like there's been a rise in it but i don't know if that's because i've been seeking it out more and my algorithms are showing it to me and i was wondering if this is something that is real 
this like kind of like cozy are people seeking out these cozy things are they more prominent or is this just like something that's happening to me personally <laughs> because of the algorithms and social media there is definitely a more of a push towards it i think that people are kind of trying to rebel against the whole idea of like the quote-unquote grind set instead mm -hmm. of like focusing on always having the hustle and always having the 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 grind and all that stuff that you're you can just sit back and be comfortable and yeah do something as simple as reading a book or uh especially during the pandemic you had well you had people getting into bread making and canning which made my life a pain in the ass to be completely honest <laughs> but because i've i've canned for years now and it's like during the pandemic i couldn't find mason jars like for a good year and it was a right pain in the ass Josh is going to start his own show. It's going to be called Yes, We Can. And he's going to teach us all how to can things. I mean, I would totally. I'm basically out of a bunch of my friends here in Edmonton. I am like the the dad, basically, where it's like if you need like advice on how to like do some repairs or like need help doing like some around the house stuff. It's like, oh, we'll just call old, old Josh up. He knows what to do. We'll call up dad. Yeah. See, Josh is like cozy, wholesome, cottage core <laughs> Edmonton guy. Exactly. Learn how to can. It's good for you. But buy your mason jars a little bit at a time so I can actually get some when it's time for me to do it. I guess is that with the, the jar shortage, is that like, I guess, the people who go to the gym all the time, how they feel like the first week of January? Oh, I like can completely. All the new people are there, like taking up yeah, all the machines. 100%. I was like going in there. I'm like, where the fuck are all the lids? Like, I never have this problem. <laughs> Yeah, I guess with the I I haven't personally noticed an uptick in cottage core um stuff uh necessarily. Uh but again, like I I'm I'm probably just not as plugged in to that type of stuff. Um but I can definitely see that like related um related to what Josh was saying about um kind of the rebellion against the grind set and also just like as a form of escapism from what seems like a super fucked up real world. Um, not that your cottage core world isn't real, but you can kind of avoid some of the, the stressors of, of daily life. Um, yeah. I, I guess it that. doesn't, it doesn't have to be specifically like cottage core, but like even like the like cozier things. Um, like I've noticed like a lot of games that are coming out now, or maybe it's just, again, maybe it's just the ads that I see and the accounts that I see that are like, Hey, here's a game where you like rearrange a house or here's a game where you make friends or mm -hmm. like, here's a game where you help people cross over to the other side. Uh, um, yes. Is that what, the, the is that what animal crossing is? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually that's a good point. Spirit fair should be called animal crossing. Um, I mean, that's that's kind of the appeal. Like my wife, um, she plays Stardew Valley. I've played it a couple times and like it's not my thing because, uh, you know, cleaning a bunch of logs and rocks out of a yard isn't. I, it's not my jam exactly, but she loves it because it is so repetitive and you're doing a lot of these like mundane tasks, but you have a lot of control over it and it like I don't know, it gives you like a structure to work around. So I can see the appeal of that for sure. That type mm. of game where there's not like a. I don't know. There's not like an an evil dragon to defeat and there's not some some quest you have to go on. Um, yeah. I think it was when I was taking like game design courses that I read this article about they they coined the concept as garden games. And this was definitely before Stardew Valley. So there wasn't necessarily a good literal example of a garden game to point at. But the the premise of the how they were describing it was that people wanted to make and play games that were a lot of what you all just described which is like less pressure calmer warm and fuzzy feeling and you kind of get to sit in a little pocket of some sort and kind of curate your experience and your environment, like in the way that you do with a garden, right? Like the, the appeal, the real life appeal of a garden, which I think does tie into the, the cottage core stuff is that you are kind of just doing something that's a bit meditative and you're getting away from whatever else you're doing in your life. And you're just sort of developing like this nurturing experience with your plants 
you're you're kind of curating the like the layout and all these things. And you're also screaming at magpies for going after your strawberries. <laughs> yeah, that's very cathartic. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I mean, there's there was examples like Harvest Moon and Rune Factory even before Stardew Valley, though. I was gonna say Harvest Moon's been around for years. Yeah. Well, I, I I guess the 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 point I was trying to make was that they weren't saying garden games had to be literal. Like for mm. me, uh, Subnautica is kind of a garden game because I like going back to my space where my base is, and I like to kind of curate the the layout and the appearance of it. And there's definitely something that appeals to me in in games like that. And I've heard a lot of people describe a feeling of you know being kind of our age now being in your you know in your 30s or so and compared to when you were 16 just not wanting to play hard games anymore or playing games on an easier mode because you're like i don't want to have that that elden ring experience like this is my relaxing time i want to play a game that i feel like i'm going to get through and win and be done with so and I, i do think those things tie into adulthood in a way like or into because I, I I don't know if that's been true for like every generation of game players or if there is something to do with the real world like now in the present year. Couldn't I'm not certain, but um with um with like more laid back gaming experiences, like you had the example of like um like Elden Ring and how how just insanely hard some of these games are. And um for me, like the appeal of something that's either repetitive or something that is just, you know, more accessible and easy to play is is almost because there's the excess of entertainment now like i don't just want to play a video game i want to play a game and listen to a podcast um at the same time so like i don't necessarily want to be 100 percent focused on this um i want yeah i don't know uh a game like fallout where sure you can play it on really hard but you can also set it really easy and just kind of go around and blow some shit up while you're listening to something else um I can see the appeal of that for sure. I have that with other things in my life where, I mean, it's it's totally invisible now, but this little setup I have to hold all the cameras and hold all the microphones and hold all the weird erotica books that I'm collecting is <laughs> like, it is a thing that has, it keeps growing in stages. Like I mentioned, okay, I just added this kind of mount so we can have a dice mic that, you know, doesn't work. Or I've added this little shelf to it. And it is it is like a form of gardening because you're kind of just curating a thing. You're growing it a little. You're shaping it to the way you want. And I noticed this trend with a lot of the things I do um, when somebody pointed this out to me over. Uh, it was a project I was working on. Uh, it was the one that we we streamed on the show when I made that Burning Man video. And because I was on EI at the time, I had so much time to fiddle with basically every aspect of it. And I was kind of at the point where I was thinking it was going to be done and there was like oh there's one more thing i can kind of fix now that i figured out how to fix this and uh yeah this was this was my partner at the time who kept coming over and being like okay you're you're telling me one more week on this thing and i was like no i swear (laughs) um but what she pointed out she was like well like you're gardening like this will like a garden is never finished was i think her point and you'll never be done as long as you are kind of like engaging with experience of gardening because you can always pull a few more weeds you can always trim a few more things but to kind of tie it back to what we were originally saying, I I think in my life that does become a thing I really engage with as I get like adult stressors in my life compared to when I was just a kid. So Yeah. There's actually sorry, did you were you finished your thought? Yeah, yeah. That that thought it was done, yeah. Okay. Um I yeah, this is actually so this is something I've discussed with Ryan as well. Um, because that's something that I seek out. Is tends to be cozier things um, that make you feel like safe and like feel good, but like also like maybe feel a little bit emotional or um, yeah, just like help you focus a little bit on introspection. Um, and we were talking about the appeal of it. And one of the appeals that Ryan had pointed out was again, that like going against the grind set thing, but also kind of a, for example, Stardew Valley is like a, it's something that you can track your progress in. Again, like Kelly said, it's something you have control over and it's a thing that like you plant, you buy the seeds, you plant the thing, you make the money and then you can improve it. 
which is like something that's not necessarily very accessible for um, a lot of people our age. This like acquiring a place and like watching a continuous improvement. And I mean, not even just for people our age, but like in general, you you know, sometimes it feels like it's one step forward, three steps back sort of thing. So it's like it's kind of it's nice to have something where you've got like a bit of control and there's like forward advancement. You can, you know, constantly keep improving and setting something up. Um, and then, yeah, also, like Josh said, that that feel that you need to be like productive and you need to be doing things and you need to be like constantly moving forward, like to just like chill and be like, I can waste some time growing in a, fa a fake garden right now. Mm hmm. Or like, yeah, it might be easier for me to go to the store and buy easier and probably cheaper for me to go to the store and buy this thing. But this is something that I find calming because I can see the results of it. So like I can go to the store, I can buy all the ingredients and I can bake this bread and I can be like, wow, this is something that I've accomplished. Or like I can, you know, like Josh said, you can like grow something in your garden and then can it. Really cool feeling. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe that's something that we're all kind of seeking yeah I, yeah, I think it is, but I also think that, like, cause your original question, you were you were talking about kind of seeing it advertised. So, is, was your question sort of like, is this new or is this like a genuine movement, or what was what was what was sort of the baseline question of? Yeah, so I guess I had two. The first one was, hey, I've noticed this. Is it real? Do you guys experience it, or is it something that's being curated at me specifically? Um, mm. And then I guess also like as like a bunch of fucking dudes. <laughs> is it like a is it something that's like more catered towards women because i see a lot of like a lot of the women there are a lot of the people that are creating these content are women or identify as women or like they're and so i'm wondering if this is like more of a gendered thing and then i was my follow-up question was going to be why um is this like a thing that we're seeing so okay so when you're saying is this real you don't you're you're asking maybe less like is the feeling of like being cozy pilled real you're asking like is this uh is it real that like there's been more more of like the algorithmic push of it is that what you're more yeah asking? or like yeah is it like something that you guys have seen and it's like is it something that like people are creating more content for this or is it like is it filling a void that was already there is it filling niches that like you guys have seen previously uh i don't like for my own examples like uh i'm in a server with a bunch of people uh and one of the, I mean, it's called the Ristorante for one thing, because it's based around like a lot of people's hobbies as baking, cooking, brewing, canning, et cetera, et cetera. Just sort of trying to get into it, share your results kind of thing. You made a cool meal, tell us the process, show us some pictures. You'd make, you're making your own beer or just having a good beer. Send us a picture of that. What do you think of it kind of thing? And it's like creating more of a, a self-sustaining kind of thing there where it's like, you know how to cook. You don't have to eat out all the time. And, and then it's not even just a case of like, oh, well, I, I know how to make hamburger help or I know how to make Mr. Noodles or something like that. I can make like a damn good meal and I can show it off for people and be proud of it. So mm -hmm. I don't know. And that's that server's got uh, men, women of both cis and trans nature. Like just I think I think it's something that people in general just tend to get into. At least now, uh, particularly now, I think the pandemic really maybe boosted it a little bit, like threw some jumper cables on there and really boosted it up. But I think it's always kind of been there in the background. I think the idea of what we've talked about, like the coziness of like gardening, meaning doing something that is kind of like quiet and cozy and meditative and like curative, like curating something. I think that's definitely very real. And I think people have always kind of discovered that as they move through life, like people find the thing that is meditative for them. Uh, I, I think of the, it's probably like apocryphal, but there was, it was one of the major, major Roman emperors. I think it was Diocletian because he was the one that retired who was like, all right, I'm done with this. I'm going to go grow cabbages. And like that, that's the, what he wanted to do because like what is more stressful than running an empire? Eventually you just want to like be like, all right, I'm out. I'm going to go. Grow yeah, gonna go on a farm. Cabbages. Yeah. Like literally gardening. With all my slaves. 
So I, I think that it is, um, I think it's a very real phenomenon that I think aging in a sort of healthy way leads you to find things that calm you down a bit. And in terms of, do I see it online? I don't, I probably haven't seen it in as pronounced a way of you. It might be part of what you're getting targeted with, but I, it, I would say there's definitely, I've seen an amount of like advertisers and such trying to appeal to that sense. Like if they're, you know, trying to sell you stuff from Ikea, like they're going to put a picture of somebody sitting in a breakfast nook with like a warm mug of tea and two hands and like it's snowing outside. There's definitely, I think there are definitely advertisers and marketers who are very much savvy enough to cater to that because they know it's out there and whether that's growing, I wouldn't be surprised because I think that, I don't know, we could probably get really rabbit holed into this, but there's definitely a lot of stressors in the world right now. And, you know, the world has always been stressful, but I think the social media and all the like connection of the information has made all those stressors very visible. So I think there are a lot of genuine efforts by people to be like, I, I, I want to do some canning because it helps me like not scroll Twitter. And I think there is also some cynical capitalizing of like, yeah, the world is stressful. You deserve <laughs> to buy yourself like a nice tea cozy off of Amazon. And also, why don't you bundle it with, you know, all of these things that will ha give you this sort of, what do you, would you call it, cottage core aesthetic as opposed to doing something practical, right? There's a difference between buying shit to make your house look more cozy, like, I don't know, some weird fucking animal tapestries versus actually doing a thing that actually calms your brain that doesn't require so much outside input, you know? Yeah. Gee, capitalism really hit for sure, sure has put a strain on people. Why don't we fix it with more capitalism? Mm -hmm. Buy some I mean, things. That's been, the, that's been the solution for a long time now. Boy, howdy, this yeah. capitalism thing seems to have some problems. What if we double down on it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fighting fire with fire, but just fighting capitalism with capitalism. Yeah, well, instead of having all these different companies, that's really stressful. What if we just made some super companies and then that's they just sold us everything? Point. Yeah, simple is better. Co sim like, co simple is very cottage core. Yeah, you know, you just you just buy all your stuff from Amazon. Don't worry about the local shops. They'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Ignore those closing signs. Yeah, just think the less time they have to spend at their shop, the more time they can spend at home making their home cozy. This exactly. actually reminds me of another sincere topic it's it's unrelated but it, it's related to this discussion of capitalism um in our we did a bonus episode recently on the show about um the union blockade of the confederacy and we focused a lot on the culture of blockade running and the contraband trade in the south during the civil war and um one of the one of the the odd little things that came up was the blockade runners, the people in the contraband trade were basically seen as being disloyal and unpatriotic to the Confederacy because they're not um, they don't have the confidence in the Confederacy to to just play along and, and not trade with the Union. And that influx of capitalism, you got these like business owners and stuff who want to keep their business going. That's what starts to chip away at the solidarity of the plantation class. So you've got this great evil of slavery being slowly undermined by another great evil capitalism um and they're kind of fighting each other uh so it's it, it was an odd situation where you're like yeah go capitalism get rid of the slavery but and then you also realize ah capitalism's gonna be really shitty too uh. that's uh i had a cousin who kind of pointed out some things about capitalism and how it actually played a big role in helping women become more independent Mm -hmm. Because, um, like in the fifties and stuff, it was like, you know, women were in charge of the, like, they were like, oh, it's you, you, you stay at home. So you take care of the finances, but mm -hmm. now suddenly you have control of this, of the money. So you get to do decide what's spent on. Um, so yeah, that's, I remember being like, no, <laughs> there's nothing <laughs> good about it. And then I was like, okay, well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess it, it makes sense for the system because, like, the more people who are able to spend money in the system, it's like, of course, that's great for capitalism. 
Did we want to end the segment so Kelly can say whatever sarcastic, shitty thing he was thinking as soon as I brought up the topic? That's hurtful. <laughs> <laughs> can I throw a, I'll, I'll, can I throw in one more hobby maybe into the pile of what we might consider? We were talking about like um, garden gardening type activities. Yeah. Um, hold on, my wife is throwing stuff at me. Chocolate. She's throwing chocolate at me. Okay. Oh, Aww. it's even a heart shape. It's a heart shape chocolate. <laughs> Aww. Beautiful. Thank you. I love you. Um, I was gonna throw in um, this idea of you know curating something that is is yours and you can go at a slow pace and you can you know kind of build something. Um, I was gonna throw in kind of the mainstreaming, relatively recently, of hobbies like you could use Warhammer as a blanket term, but I knew you were gonna say Warhammer. Yeah, mini, mini painting in general, um, just because of the idea that like yes, at its core, it's a game, but there's tons of people in the hobby who have no intention of ever using it that way. Um, it purely is about painting and building something. And whether you're whether you're painting something individually or making like more of a scene or a diorama, it does have that um, that more slow pace. You're doing something. You're taking your time. You can spend as much or as little time on a model as you want to. Um, but um, we talked about how, you know, a garden's never finished. You could say the same thing with with some of these models where you could I mean, you could spend weeks months working on the same thing adding tiny minuscule details if you want to um and kit bashing stuff together and yeah the way i see that discussed you know on twitter and on instagram in that community it's it's very much the same type of appeal um i mean that's kind of why i gave it a shot I and mean, i started painting when i was in grad school um just because i needed i needed to do something that didn't involve reading words off of a page or off of a screen um and so I was like, oh, I'll give this a shot. Um, and obviously it, it sucks when you start and you can't do anything, but like you slowly build up your skills and you feel like you're really building an arsenal of something and you can make stuff that you feel happy with and you're proud of, um, you know, when it's finished and you can take cool pictures and put them on Instagram. Um, yeah, it's it, I kind of would put that in the same category of just kind of a feel good, slow paced hobby. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, um, yeah, when he started thinking, talking about hobbies and things, I was just like, oh, mm -hmm. you're a dude oh, yeah. that's talking about a cozy hobby. It's going to be Warhammer. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Warhammer or, or, or some related miniature paint. I, I prefer, honestly, painting historical miniatures because it's like, I feel like I have a bit more of a scaffold to go off of. Like, hey, this is what I'm trying to, to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't quite have the paralysis of choice that you have with, with, you know, other things. Um, you know, if I'm trying to paint a particular historical period. Um, but yeah, I, it, same applies to any of those, I would say. I'm surprised that you aren't into assembling those like miniature ships and bottles. No, I've never been I've never been much of a much of a model ship person and certainly not a ship and bottle person. I never tried. Maybe I'd really enjoy it. Maybe that is my new cozy hobby. That'll be your next one. And if you fuck it up, I mean, it's just then it's just more relevant for your interest in, in your podcast. It's exactly. just a shipwreck. Perfect. I actually don't think I ever did introduce myself. No, I don't think actually you said no. your name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Tanner. Than ever? I'm Tanner. I'm the assistant barnacle farmer on the show. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Nice. All right. Well, if, it's, if anyone, no one has anything else to add there. Do we want to pivot to game? Uh, so this is the barnyard version of the theme. You have a barnyard version of the theme? Yeah. Don't you don't you watch episodes you're not on, Josh? No, I don't because oh. I'm very self-absorbed. Well, here it is. Five, six, seven, eight. Oh, man, that is... And we'll be playing that one every time from now on. I really <laughs> hope we. I really hope we don't. Maybe, maybe lower the though. volume on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that halfway through it's just choking, and then someone saying, "Wow, that's horrible." Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I I agree with them. Um, 
but yes, to tidy up the little the little cottage core thing there before we move to the game, I just want to say that uh, if you are sincerely interested in getting into canning, it is a good way of making sure that you have food all the time. Because if you're like me and suck at buying snacks, you can just open a jar of pickles up and just have a good time with those. Mm. Or if you like making Caesars, having garnish on hand at all times is an asset. I yeah. If you start, if you wanted to start your own segment called Yes We Can, I would totally watch it. <laughs> you can teach me how to can when I move to Switzerland. Perfect. How much I mean, are you? you are... <laughs> how much are you getting from the canning lobby to say all this? <laughs> big can. <laughs> oh, as we like to call them, big cans. Big can. <laughs> <laughs> that was my nickname in high school. <laughs> 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 um, they're they're paying me a lot. They're paying me in mason jars, which is basically better than gold at this point because. Not only can you use them, this is where I transition to the ad pivot right here. Not only can you use mason jars to can, you can also use them to put your cocktails in if you're a basic bitch and then put them on Instagram. And it'll look like you're a bit more creative than just using a normal cup like a normal person. Hell yeah. Think, think about that. Yeah. I think I'm really selling these mason jars to the people. So what you're describing there, like that's astroturfed cottage core. It's like it's cottage core just for Instagram, basically. But your life is not less stressful because you are worrying about getting your lighting perfect for your post. Yeah, instead I'm just like, cool. I got some pickled carrots in this jar now. Now to let it sit for a month on my counter, and then I'll open it up, and it'll be a good time. I want to try making kimchi this year. What's the strangest thing you've ever pickled? What's the strangest thing I've ever pickled? Uh, probably sausage, to be completely honest. Uh, I used a pressure canner to make some pickled sausage, and not a fan personally. Uh, I know people are into it, but I is think that if euphemism? I'm gonna... <laughs> you, put, yeah. you put some sausage in a pressure canner. Uh, no there's judgment. a lot of pressure. No judgment. <laughs> if, that, if, if you're into that, that's fine. <laughs> uh, but no, that, that's probably the weirdest one. I'm pretty conventional. Um, you know, beets, pickled uh, beans, onions. I did some garlic for somebody because they wanted pickled garlic. Uh, you can do olives if you like that disgusting thing. And yeah, you What's can use the pressure weirdest thing to you've make stews. seen someone pickle? Uh, a toe. Nice. There's a bar in, I think it's Yukon, that has a, like a pickled toe inside some liquor. And you can drink the liquor for a certain amount of money or some of the liquor. And they've had to replace the toe multiple times because people have eaten the toe. Is it human? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a frostbitten toe. Someone froze it off you, and then they donated it. Yeah. If you drink the toe, do you have to donate your own toe to replace it? <laughs> you, got, you gotta pay. You gotta pay a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, you get fined if you if you swallow the toe. They're yeah, not easy so to source. There's your that little makes fun sense. fact of the day. For the record, if you're sh what, trying to explain this to your coworkers. And you want to Google it? I don't recommend. So the shot's called "Kiss the Toe." I don't re recommend googling that in front of all of your coworkers when they can all see your screen. Just as a heads up, not that it's ever happened to me. You got to really toe the line when you're showing people that thing. I hate you. <laughs> hey, you do this all the fucking time. Fuck you. <laughs> yes, now that I've got that out of my system, I am I'm ready to writing, start the game. I'm just writing "Kiss the Toe" on my paper, and I'll remember <laughs> what that means. <laughs> I'm sure I'll you will. What that means for sure later. Speaking of sex toys, why don't we start by introducing Kelly's character in the game? See, that would have been a great segue. Yeah, and I'll just take that good take of you doing it, and we'll keep that in. Perfect, I think it's a bit perfect. reductive to reduce this sentient robot to just a sex toy. I absolutely agree. Can we have a half-hour sincerity hour about that? Like, <laughs> oh, what oh, about Sasha? Bots, are you Sasha, what what is your plan here? Oh, there you got a cat head in the shot now. What's your plan here, girly? Bye. She gone. Yeah. All right. Pego. Pego is a pegging robot. Um, tall, dark, very smooth skin, robust and imposing, a little boxy. Um, obligatory boxy jokes. Uh, we'll we'll <laughs> we'll splice those back in. Uh, Pego came online when the ship went to yellow alert. Uh, Pego was dormant when not in use, so. Pego's main, um, Pego is programmed to love and not much else. So Pego's main kind of angle on how to fix problems is through pegging or other forms of loving, which are in beta. 
All right. Oh, all and right. Pego does not need oxygen to breathe. That is Pego's. That is their unique talent. That is a very unique talent. Ah, good. I'm I'm glad you've also gotten dressed for the occasion again. That's very important to me. I want you to know that keeps me in the experience. Yes, I am dressed <laughs> as a robot. Thank you. Yes, yes, definitely you, Kelly, and not our fine next character. Uh, Tanner, would you like to give your character? Uh, yes. Uh, Wilback Willie is a former sea captain uh, with some military and civilian sailing experience. Uh, something terrible happened to Wellback Willie in his past uh, that he refers to as just the incident. Um, and his left hand has been replaced with a set of uh, tongs uh, that are, uh, he can use it to manipulate objects around him. Um, but of course not quite as well as with a hand. Uh, Wellback Willie is now deathly afraid of entering the water. Um, which is a good thing. He's a former sea captain. Um, I think that's everything. That's all, right. all you need to know. I think that's good for Wheelback Willie. And then finally, Nicole, bringing up the anchor, if you will. ER. Um, so my character's name is Helm McKeelstern. Um, I'm an old, grizzled. I look like I've been at sea for a while. I'm missing an eye and I have a peg leg. Um, I look like I've been at sea for a while, um, but once people talk to me for a bit, it clearly it quickly becomes very apparent that I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. I don't know how to sail. Probably never sailed in my life. Am I a real am I a real sailor? Am I suffering from a bout of amnesia? Am I a grifter? Um, who's to say? All right. And when we left our intrepid heroes. They had just activated the ship they were exploring, and it was headed to a destination quite a distance away. Now, the trip itself was going to take a lot of time, so we're just going to skip forward to the point where they're just about to arrive at the set coordinates. The ship cruises towards its destination, growing, groaning under the strain of water pressure and substantial damage. From... The main hallway where they had first entered, where the sub is still wedged, the console that they originally used to enter the captain's quarters buzzes to life. With a click, click, click sound, you see a text scan across the screen asking ascend, question mark, with a Y and an N for answers. Quick question. Um, I Am I still stuck in the... Hole that I'm oh, playing yeah. with my pen. <laughs> you sure are, buddy. <laughs> okay, cool, 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 cool. Just checking. The whole time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea how long we've been traveling for. I've just been stuck with my hole in the ground. Let's just say this days and days. So I hope you can remove that leg at some point, or you have been making that corner your own corner. Oh, boy. What if I was born with it? What if Maybe I was they're born with I it. Am? <laughs> yeah, maybe born with it. Oh boy! Well, maybe that's it's gonna be a pretty ripe uh -huh. corner, is what I'm gonna say. Pretty yeah. ripe corner. For the record, how long have I been in this corner, blocking this hole with my peg leg? Multiple days. Oh boy! Cool. <laughs> and so this this has sort of been implied then by the story is that neither Pego nor Whaleback Willie went to go help Helmut Kielstern at any point. <laughs> I guess not. I mean, kind of checks out for Pego, because Pego likes to assist, but what is Pego going to do to seal that up? Well, wait, is it about sealing wait. the hole, or is it about getting the leg out of the hole? I was like, couldn't well, Helmut Kielstern's leg still be plugging the hole and just detached from... Well, that's the question. Is can, can Helmut Kielstern detach the leg? I guess we have to ask the character that. Yeah, can we, yeah, can we roll can for we that? Ro can we roll for strength? Yes, let's. What, 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 are, what are our options here? Here, I, I've, I've closed that sheet. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll just roll for strength while I panically open up the the rest. See of the if stats. we can see if we can wrench it out of there. Okay. Um, I have. Okay, I'm a regular at at strength. So wait, are we trying to pull the peg out of the hole, or do I try to pull the, your? Yeah, body are you trying no. to peg? No, no, no. <laughs> if we pull the peg yeah. out of the hole, the ship is going down. Yeah, we want to okay. leave the leg in the hole. Yeah. Wait, is that okay. hard? Like, how are peg legs attached? Aren't they just kind of sitting in a like a cup, like Terry Fox style? It's been there a long, a long time. I I don't know. I was 
I was imagining this one being like screwed in or something, so it would take a lot of lot of force to get off. Yeah, like screwed into your bone end. Yeah, yeah. We that play for keeps. Horrible. Is that what? You don't fuck that's, around. that's not a real thing. That's not what pirates do. Is it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You tell me, man. I I mean, I feel like it's incumbent on the. Uh, the we are like sailing. It. We are sailing in a sea of blood right now. So I think that's not the most extreme thing in the world. To have it a screwed is, is in pretty intense. prosthetic leg. Oh, I got a 12. You got a 12. <laughs> yeah. All right. So if you want to wrench that leg off so that you can <laughs> use facilities and eat. Okay. I'm going to say you managed to do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I can I. Yeah. Can we say that like, the, because I got a 12 that they immediately thought of and did that? <laughs> yeah, so you don't okay, smell well, like piss and shit now that you're yeah. getting off. <laughs> okay, I do have a crutch, so oh, there I you can go. still get around. You can still get around, and there's just your peg leg sitting there in this hole, plugging it. Uh -huh. And we're all in the room when this happens, right? Yes. Ensign McHale Stern, may I please wait ahead? Hang on, are you getting music when I do that? No. Oh, okay, it makes sense. Okay, right, anyway. only the music of Pego. <laughs> <laughs> Ensign McKeel Stern, may I apply some soothing balm to your wound? Uh, Josh, do I have a wound? <laughs> no, no. I think he just because you've detached your leg, and he is not the smartest robot. But it was in the screwed world. into your leg, and you <laughs> ripped it out with like the. Yeah, but I've got make her, make a strength. That means I healed up right away. Did you just also? Did you just call me Hanson? I, we we've had this exact conversation. Ensign. Two episodes Ensign. ago. Oh. Because I assumed your rank was Ensign. Oh. Yeah, yep. you could be. You could do like a Leslie Nielsen bit. I am serious, but don't call me Shirley. <laughs> kind of thing. Fair. <laughs> um. And yeah. Susan McGilster, and are you sure you do not want some salve rubbed on your stub, just in case? Yar, yeah, I'll, I'll take your stub. Wait, do I have to put my peg leg, in, my leg stump in your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> no, it can be applied <laughs> externally. Not all healing has to be penetrative. <laughs> I, you may oh, find I... you have you may find sex i mean you may find healing more enjoyable for everyone involved if you are all willing to redefine what healing is <laughs> i i only want the salve if it means that i can put my my leg in your mouth i don't oh, want it applied you. any other way <laughs> affirmative <laughs> you may place your leg into my access port do you want me to apply it sensually or normal style <laughs> is there like a another extreme there does it is there a third option that's like maybe a little bit rough if i'm into that <laughs> you know Rough being a sailor and, and used to a rough life i mean of course <laughs> affirmative please note roughness is in beta mode do you want to proceed? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I can handle it. I'm, I'm pretty tough. I've been sailing for a while, so. <laughs> All right. So if I'm if I'm going to be rough, and we're going to see if Helma Kielstern can handle it, does that mean like maybe I'm rolling an opposed strength against his resilience? I was going to say. Um... Strength versus resilience myself, actually. So, yeah, that works perfectly. Okay, I have neither of those things. Are you normal? N normal style? I am, I am normal style, unlike this <laughs> situation. <laughs> to happen. Okay. Oh, boy. Not looking good. Oh, good lord, I rolled a four. <laughs> oh, here we go. All right, well, I'm also normal style, and we're about to find out how well lined up this uh, new and improved dice cam is. I see oh, so a six. Yes, I do. I do see a six. So what happens is when Pego decides to get a little rough with the healing, you feel something and it's not pain. 
but maybe it is pain. But maybe it's something deeper than pain. Something tied towards pain. Maybe you feel a little bit of pleasure going along with it. Oh, no. <laughs> I need you to roll your <laughs> resilience again. Oh, no. Am I going to come? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God. I got a 10. You managed to restrain yourself <laughs> and allow Pego to continue the healing process. But you think along the line, or along the way, you might have picked up a new fetish. <laughs> new? new? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe just discovered it. <laughs> so yeah, you've had the salve applied to you. Cool. And so Whaleback Willie was just like watching, right? Like just sitting in the <laughs> extra chair across the room. <laughs> Is he also so we have a chair finish? in the room so you can watch medical procedures. <laughs> Every that medical was... bay has the, the watching chair. Yeah, the observation. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was considering our options. Uh I was I was thinking on the eternal question of uh ascend, yes or no. Uh that was that was the question, right? It that was, was yeah. Ascend, it just says not... yeah. It just says ascend. Yeah. Okay. Like to the surface of the water, or to like it's an the ethereal rapture. plane. <laughs> yeah. It, it so, merely says ascend. Sorry, have we traveled through the lake of blood, or like off the planet and through space? In the blood, still. Oh, so we're just like we're submarining around. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Okay, so the, the peg leg isn't like protecting us from a vacuum, it's protecting us from just like flooding. Flooding, yeah. B blooding. Blooding, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty sure that's a military term. Okay. And the thing is on, the, the ship that we're on is on some sort of autopilot to get to the Destin. Yeah, exactly. Mr. Willie, I... Oh, no, wait, I was calling you Captain Admiral. Captain Admiral Willie... No, it was, it, was it Admiral Captain? Admiral Somebody go Admiral back and watch the episode. I think it was Admiral Captain. I think he said we could call him what we could call him whale back. And we'll edit all this out. Admiral Captain Willie, are you certain you want to ascend? It appears we are already on a set course. Let's do it. All right, so you're gonna press the Y key? Why not? Spring break. I'm gonna I'm gonna press it. The ship shudders and begins still moving forward, but slowly you feel like when you're in an elevator that starts going up for the first time, you feel that little bit of pressure on your body as you, the ship begins to ascend and ascend and soon. And it is ascending me. <laughs> I can't say what I wanted to say there, Kelly. It would have been mean. Yeah, you would never. I would never do that. And then what after, What seems like only a few minutes, you feel the ship stop ascending and slowly begin slowing as it bumps up against a hard surface. Is it how McKeel turns dick? Because it's still hard for the healing? I'm so sorry. Please continue. <laughs> Just waiting for you to get it out of your system. I knew something was... <laughs> I'm on my third drink, so. How did your dick get outside the ship? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my cat's being a big distraction. Sorry, I it's, need to move it's her for canon a now. That happened. That's fine. You do that, and we'll just sort of GM ourselves. Give me half a second here, Sasha. You are adorable, but you're kind of actually a pain in the ass right now. So, so I'll just Don't do my Josh GM voice. Don't you talk to her that way. There we go. Good girl. Okay, so as you continue to mash the ascend button, uh, <laughs> your ship triumphantly passes through the whatever ceiling it was and uh, a bunch of unicorns fart rainbows at you and you win. You've, you've nailed it. You've nailed the exact tone I was going for. Another message scrolls across the console screen. It says, airlock released. And a sharp hiss is heard. Wait, the ascend button is the airlock release button? Well, you've stopped ascending. Like, oh. So I'm going to go towards, the, I'm assuming there's some sort of like ladder to get out of here. Yes. I'm going to kind of like fumble towards it because I just want to have my back turned to everyone else so I can hide my boner. That's that's very fair. Because <laughs> I'm see... still thinking about <laughs> sticking my leg in Pego's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you see a, uh, a ladder descend from a 
small slit of light from what appears to be a porthole near the roof of the dining hall. <laughs> a small slit and a porthole? Uh-huh. <laughs> McKeelster is having a rough time of it right now. <laughs> yeah, um, McKeelster puts... Uh, Pops two fingers into the slit and one into the porthole. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna be resilience rolls for the rest of the game at this rate. <laughs> so okay, so the airlock open, not like there's a there's a air breach, just like it is opened into open air. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. That was, that, that was gonna be real bad it. for the other two, but <laughs> yeah, you would have been fine. <laughs> well, fine. I might just cause a whole breach on purpose, just if I get bored. <laughs> All right, so you're gonna send up the ladder then. Uh, I don't think I can, because <laughs> I have. I'm kind of a big box on treads. I, <laughs> you you I totally do. are. I I want to. I do oh, want what? to ascend the ladder. All right, and uh, I want to look at both of them, but kind of before he leaves the room. And human roommates, I was not programmed to ascend ladders. I was programmed <laughs> to love. What should we do? <laughs> Um, uh, so I, I think what I we need- have quite the affinity for Pego now, and I can bear to leave him behind because he's opened up a whole new side of me that I never knew I had before. So I'm going to stick my crutch down the hole, and I'm going to say, uh, uh, Pego, why don't you try putting this here <laughs> crutch in in your mouth, um, <laughs> and, and I'll pull you up by it. So you want me to like close my. Yes. front hatch onto the crutch and just sort of bite <laughs> bite down yeah. on the crutch. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm going to need you to roll a uh, strength roll, Nicole. And uh, I'm also going to get you to roll a strength test there, uh, Kelly, although I expect it'll be a low one because I expect a robot can clamp onto things relatively well. Uh, I got a six. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm apparently not good at strength, so we'll see. Well, we'll see, I guess. Do you want to turn my camera on? I spent so long on this. I spent fucking 400 bucks on this camera. Jesus Christ. Well, I mean, it's my phone. God damn it. <laughs> $400 well spent. All well, right. It's also so. a phone. So eight. Is that your roll? Um, for me, it's kind of covered by the timer and the eyeball. So I can't. Let's just. Yes, it's eight. I yes. guess I could look at it in real life. Yeah. That would be... Or I can do that. Yeah. Uh, so eight, and you rolled a six. Okay, with great difficulty, you managed to haul Pego out of the the hatch there and onto the surface of the boat. And as I'm being pulled up, I'm elated because I've never really experienced like verticality before. <laughs> You're and, just, and I say, just stoked. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is exhilarating. <laughs> I have never felt this way before. <laughs> and I'm also kind of exhilarated because this <laughs> crutch is an extension of my body and so seeing it <laughs> in your mouth is like getting me going again <laughs> the oh, kill screen oh, is just yeah. a whole new level that's, of things now <laughs> that's the stuff <laughs> alright I'm just As watching you... all this from below just shaking my head disapprovingly <laughs> <laughs> the, the degeneracy on this ship yeah like it never you happened could have when been, you were in you charge you could have been helping by pushing from the bottom but you're just like no <laughs> They've got this. <laughs> Pushing from the bottom is Pego's job. I don't even want to get involved. <laughs> so you, uh, yeah, so all three of you managed to get up on top of the ship there. And you look around and it appears to be some sort of like dock on a small. <laughs> you doing okay there, champ? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Sorry, go ahead. There's a dock. A dock. Do you want to go over what just happened there? <laughs> I don't think, I don't we'll think fix that. it in post. <laughs> oh, great. For the record, Ryan Jason made Mc chili Gilster, for dinner tonight. What was that noise? <laughs> Did I cause you harm? <laughs> Now see what's great is that like my my internet has been really choppy and it's going in and out, but like I definitely heard that. <laughs> Good. So, Good. Catch so, all the important parts. The uh <laughs> It's on a dock that appears to have only one other structure on it. 
the dock itself to be seems to be made out of a hard rock surface and the dock just built into it. And then there's a large monocolored structure with large spires and spe- uh, and whatnot on its roof and stained glass windows. So I noticing that uh, Willie has come up the ladder behind us, I uh, I turn to him and say, Admiral Captain Willie, I hope you did not feel like you were not welcome to participate in that extractive maneuver. <laughs> you know, the only thing more beautiful than uh, teamwork shared between two people is teamwork shared between three people. <laughs> It's all right, son. I got up to plenty of that when I was in the Navy. <laughs> Affirmative. All right. So, okay. So, what that... was in front of us? I was thinking about bits. There's a giant <laughs> sprawling vista. <laughs> how, you got, how you got those out of your system? It's the. Uh, no, the, but go on. The island itself appears to be made out of just like a hard rock substance. Um, the, the dock is built into it, it's not broken into or, or anything like that. And it's a strange off-white color. On top of that, there is a another structure that has spires and stained glass windows all over it. And it seems to be made out of the same white rock surface. Is it bone? Can we test it to see if it's bone? I don't know there how you, you test it to see if it's bone, but you can. Yeah, Pe- Pego, uh, do you mind taking a chomp out of this one? <laughs> can you just bite some more things? I mean, Pego does have the the R two D two arm. He yeah. does. Yes. I don't remember. Did it get damaged, or did the port I was trying to use get damaged? I think the port you were using got damaged. Okay. Well, I mean, surely in the in the time we were traveling under blood, I had enough time to fix it. So yes, I'm sure. Um, if anybody is just so this isn't a function anything, of anything. If anything bad happened, we've now retconned it. So. Yes, it's fine now. So this isn't a function that the the mouth hole takes care of. This is this is the <laughs> robot arm. Um, I feel like there's different ways of sampling. So like, I've already used my robot arm to drill into it, and you know, mm-hmm. kind of extract some samples to analyze what the composition is, maybe whether it's radioactive, mm-hmm. maybe how old it is. I think that would all be the R two D two arm. Whereas the front port, I would maybe put a small rock mm-hmm. sample inside of, or a sample of whatever inside of, to kind of see how it tastes. Right. So there's different methods of analysis. Yeah, put that multi-purpose mouth hole to use. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first time you've said that, is it, Wellbeck? <laughs> it is not the first time I've heard it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try to kind of drill into the substance a little bit. All right. And uh, do my, you know, my full spectrum of analyses on it. And because this is a very, there's a lot of unknowns we're dealing with. Uh, well, actually, we'll see what I can analyze, but I may or may not do further tests. All right. So to see how much you managed to get out of it, I'm going to get you to roll an intelligence roll. Hell yeah. You know I'm good at that. Ew, Look at nice that. One. Oh, that was perfect. Another thing people are missing out on if they're listening. So we got an eight there, if that's what it looks like right there. You are yeah. able to discern that it is mostly made out of calcium. Mm. So like t- like teeth? Yes. Yeah, mm. you, you know, I'm not I, I don't I'm not a smart man. I don't consider myself a smart man, but I'm sensing a theme here with the uh, natural um, outcroppings and things that are happening on this planet. Um, I suspect we should keep our eyes open for more weird body parts. Affirmative. Okay. All right. I think uh, one one of you guys should lead the charge into that building there. I think uh, we should go there for sure, but like maybe someone else first. What is the terrain like? Like, what's the the actual... Relatively smooth, a few ridges, a little bumpy in some spots, but a relatively even walking surface. And you're not just talking about Wilbeck Willie's asshole? I don't know. No, you you, you stretched <laughs> for that one, much like Wilbeck Willie's asshole. Uh, 
Stretch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey So there's there's one building. Is that what we said? Yeah, just one building. I want to go in the building. Yeah. So yeah. So like, doesn't it doesn't seem like? Because I mean, my treads are built for like really flat spaceship floors. So it's is it? Am I going to handle okay on this? You, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Okay. It'll just be like there might be an occasional bump, but you won't like high center or anything like that. Okay, good. Because like the the design of Pego is like unforgivably low riding to the ground. <laughs> like yeah, people with like, tuners like, would be. I feel like I have like maybe three inches of clearance. Like a high center on a speed bump, kind of low. Well, like a speed bump is fine because if you imagine like big triangular treads, they're going to kind of just roll flat over it. Uh, oh, yeah. Like if I tried to straddle a speed bump, I might yeah. high center. Yeah. 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 So okay, okay, yeah. I don't I don't get to straddle speed bumps. So it's just part of the it's part of the difficulty of being Pego is you don't get to do the things that other people get to do. Like, you know, just <laughs> straddle a speed bump. Yeah. All right, so you head towards the building then, and the first thing that draws your attention is that there's a door with no handle, and the only reason you can tell it's a door is because you can see the slight seams in the wall itself, and then a small slot in the middle. Well, I put my R2-D2 arm in the slot. <laughs> Naturally. Put, put your dick yeah. in it. <laughs> well, if it wasn't Already damaged... On it. <laughs> if it wasn't damaged before, it is now, because you feel like... A punching I put motion. It in gently. On, you no, but you once it's in there, you feel a punching motion, and an object. Oh, I'm damaged. Punches damage, straight not the door. into it. Yeah, yeah. They are, you know, I hear with things like this Ow. that you should use lots of lube. They say that more <laughs> is more in this situation. <laughs> so the punch extracts itself, and I am nothing happens. Critically low on lube. Your uh, your arm is now have a, has a hole punched in it, and nothing responds. No, did I kind of like that, you know, rough, painful experience? <laughs> Roll a resilience. Let's find out. All right. You resist the urge to develop a new fetish. <laughs> Hell yeah. But he I is still damaged, number right? One. Yes, he is still damaged. You extract the arm and you see that there is a small hole, only about an eighth of an inch in diameter, punched. I see, clean we're still the misgendering arm. the robot. Well, let there this be a, a warning to you, son. This is what happens when you go sticking your dick in strange holes. <laughs> uh, Admiral Captain Willie, please do not misgender me. <laughs> I am not anyone, son. <laughs> <laughs> You've told me many it that many, many times before. Mistitling I'm, me. <laughs> I'm trying to improve myself. I'll get better. What matters is that you are. Sitting your crusty ass down and listening. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so we still need to get in the door. Yes. Has anything has anything changed about the door? Nothing at all. Okay. Uh well, my perception's pretty good. I'm gonna try and perceive a uh I don't know, some kind of latch or button or buzzer or something that's going to help us open this door. Can I do All that? Right. Yes, you can. All right. Uh, so if I'm good at it, do I, I roll? Two How sets do I do of, that? you roll four dice, uh, two sets of two, uh, okay. because you're checking, you're taking the and best take, of those two rolls. Take yeah. the highest two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that would be 11. All right. As the arm of, Pego is returning to them. You notice that the hole is so tiny that it could just be a very large gauge needle that punched through it. Yar. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Do you think this might be like one of those blood oath things? Like, do you think maybe your blood would open it if it was human Blood. No offense, Pego. There's not, not that there's anything wrong with being a robot. I think. And wonderful. without even really listening just, to your apology, yeah. Pego just kind of like uses the RT charm to seize your hand <laughs> and just oh, be like, "Oh god!" Great idea. And starts moving it towards the hole. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna we're gonna take a, a strength roll for Pego and a reaction roll for Helma Keystern. I don't. I feel like it. I don't know that I'm trying to force it. I just assumed that it was a suggestion, so I'm just kind of doing it. 
Mm, but like the strength itself will just be like whether or not you could, they will react in time to you just like helping them along. I got a seven. You got a seven? Yeah, because I am definitely right. pulling away. I have I I am bad at bravery. <laughs> so I'm rolling an opposed strength or opposed reaction? Opposed strength in this case. Because uh, you might not know your own strength. You think you're helping, but you're just you're guiding too hard. And that's an eight. Not an eight. Oh, no. So you aren't able to snatch your hand away in time before it is <laughs> put into the slot by Pego's arm. And you feel a sharp, brief flash of pain as a needle drives into your hand and traps it there for a few seconds. Yar, ow. I already lost some digits. I can't afford to lose any more. The needle extracts itself and you're able to pull your hand out. Okay. And the, the slot all of a sudden seals like with a pneumatic force that seems like it would just shear a hand right off if it was still in there. Good lord. And the door creaks open on hidden hinges. Revealing Ooh. a a what it looks to be almost like a temple room. There's lots of pews. And more uh, off-white bone spires ca carved into ornate shapes leading towards so a giant. So bone, then. It is bone, <laughs> right? We're, we're, that's canon now. It is bone. I mean, it's, uh, it's a rock made out of a lot of calcium, but not entirely out of calcium. Yeah. Henson McGilster, that was excellent work on sticking your hand into the hole. You know, actually, after I'd done it, I realized that, like, it's kind of, you know, it is sticking an appendage into a hole, and I kind of liked it in that fashion. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for pushing my limits, Pego. Uh, you really are teaching me new things about well. myself. Would you like to do it again? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe maybe later. Maybe, yeah. Uh, you know what? Actually, my hand does need healing now that it's had a needle through it. Could I? Could I? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like insert... a... Like Chris, a hypodermic needle. Your mouth, please. <laughs> Once again, Pego has gotten healed. a little overexcited and is kind of like <laughs> ninety percent of the way through the question, and they are already bringing Helmut Kielstern's hand into their mouth. <sighs> Excellent. <laughs> oh yeah, so, that's the stuff. Oh. While while the other two members of the party are pleasing each other, <laughs> <laughs> healing healing each other. <laughs> Whaleback Willie. There is no pleasure to me. I exist only to please <laughs> others. Whaleback <laughs> Willie, I am I am starting to look around this uh this temple, this bone temple, temple of the bone that we find ourselves in, and I realize that it starts to look very familiar, like I've been here before. Oh my. And I think back to one of my younger days, uh, when I was sailing in a less than legal capacity, uh, and we we conducted quite a uh, quite a profitable raid on a temple that looked a lot like this one. All right, so I'm gonna get you to roll a perception then. Uh, perception five. Uh, 12. I have two sixes. 12. Oh, full crit here. The memories rush back into your head like a tidal wave. And you remember seeing, as your mates were carrying off the loot from the temple, figures that looked exactly like the ones carved into these, uh, these white rock feet, uh, spires with tentacles for mandibles and long and gangly hands and a face that isn't quite rendered correctly. It almost looks like every time someone tried to sculpt the face itself beyond the mandibles, it starts to get lots of chips and carves and slashes into it. Yeah, or did, did anyone else read a, a book by a, a horror author from back in the day about Cthulhu? I think it was called. Does this sound familiar to anyone else? <laughs> Scanning archives for said information. I I seem to remember that his cat had a name that we can't repeat on the stream. <laughs> Yar, I do remember the author himself being a bit of a bastard. Results found. I have found 
628,000 fan fiction entries for Cthulhu. Would you like to start? Would you like to go through them from most to least erotic? Yes. <laughs> can we can we sort the erotic ones by the numbers of times the word tentacle is used? If that means that we can find more options of appendages going into other things, then yes, I would like to. I would support this decision. What does McKeelstern's browser history look like? <laughs> yeah, I am f- <laughs> like if I if I had a phone right now, I'd be frantically googling <laughs> like everything to do with this. I've just found a new fetish, and I want to know everything about it. Results prepared. Please note that much of this data is ancient and may be corrupted. As a result, results may be presented in ways that seem poorly improvised. Chapter one, the old man and the tentacle. (laughs) (laughs) The next three hours are spent with (laughs) Pego giving detailed, lurid descriptions of various archived fan fictions of Cthulhu. And from that, if we can all, all three of you roll a perception here. Well, I got a 10. Uh, I have a 10. A 10, a 10, and... I have a... Oh, that that's a 9. All right, so you're able to all piece together from the various... Uh, fan fictions, some common themes. You're really failing at putting this into camera shot. Uh, no, some perfect. various themes that make you think that these at least are part of a general mythos. Uh, and so as a result, you feel like you understand this elder god a bit more than when you first started. Uh, and as you contemplate, your eyes slowly glide over to the giant altar in the center of the temple. And and so this is this is just at the end of that 3 hours, right? Yes. And so from that day forward, the tentacle <laughs> felt like a whole new appendage and would never forget that extremely steamy and illuminating night. The end. Oh fuck yeah, that's the stuff. <laughs> Epilogue. <laughs> 16 years later uh, and then yeah there's another like 20 minutes of that and then uh, yeah so we'll just we'll, we don't need to go do that we'll jump ahead another 20 minutes and from this grand corruptive I apologize the epilogue cannot be completed do you want me to attempt again from the beginning? Yes. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't look at the altar. We have time. <laughs> yeah, we Relay just want to request. Gonna, we're just going to keep <laughs> hanging out until something happens because, like, <laughs> we're just not feeling like there's, like, a lot we want to, like, really actively do. We're kind of having a lot more fun with the tentacle erotica that like archaic I think, tentacle I think, erotica uh, I think uh, uh, Ryan Whaleback needs to roll a resilience because he is he is not having a good time right now resilience <laughs> resilience alright uh, I'm normal at that so let's see let's see if I can resist the erotic temptation of the tentacle uh, a 12 a 12 12. Good lord. <laughs> Fucking crits for days here. My, I mean, my dice we're, are we're taking his word for it, but that's true. Here, uh, I can I can I can show them to you. Oh yeah, he picked them up very strategically <laughs> there. No. For real. He's, I'm, he's, uh, I'm an honest <laughs> captain. Wilback has decided that he when he hears the yes, his heart sinks. He can't handle another three hours of this, and he launches into the most verbose and panicked reasons why we should not repeat the three hours of fan fiction. Wow, that feels like railroading. (laughs) I will say, uh, regarding the request to hear the story again, if I remember these folk correctly from my time uh, on this island, uh, 
they they don't like to have their dirty laundry aired uh, in such a way uh, with all these stories being repeated. And they say that if you repeat them enough, they'll come and visit you in person and and act them all out. I, 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 that sounds wrong, and I think we should risk it. <laughs> oh, well, I... Captain Willie, you are mistaken. These stories are from Earth, or whatever our home planet is. <laughs> they are not from this strange tooth island. I'm visibly disappointed. <laughs> I, I, I noticed that uh, Helmut Keelstone is disappointed and say, Oh, I thought it was, I thought that you, oh, Oh dear, and ending program. And then, like, uh, Pego gets really quiet. <laughs> like, even the whirring of their servos gets kind of like a lot <laughs> quieter. Admiral Captain Willie, I believe it was you who wanted to move on. Perhaps you would like to offer a suggestion. Uh, did we did we say that there's some sort of altar? Yes, in, right this, in the I center. I stick my arm yeah. into the altar. <laughs> Not yet. We might need that later. <laughs> but it doesn't pay to default to always sticking your arm in things. I've found in life. <laughs> and then he he holds I... up his he holds up his <laughs> clickers. Uh, his, yeah, his, uh, his I, I respectfully disagree. Have I ever told you about the incident? <laughs> <laughs> Negative. Well, I think now is hardly the time, but I'll tell you <laughs> some, sometime, sometime later. Uh, let's check out this altar. Let's let's Wait, see what the, we've got up here. Yeah, in 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 the incident, did this happen to be you sticking your arm into a hole of some sort? Because I think we have time to hear <laughs> that story. Well, well, you see, the thing about holes is they. <laughs> They need to be filled with something. <laughs> and Yarp. when you're a when you're a young sailor, when you've only got your twenty five years under your belt, uh, you you don't know too much about the world, and uh, well, you learn quickly uh, out on the open sea. And sometimes uh, one man's hole is another man's treasure. <laughs> We'll go with that. Uh, I can confirm it, this is the case. <laughs> anyway, long story short, no, I did not lose my hand by sticking it into a hole because I was much, much smarter than that. I, I lost am, it to I a... I am instantly not interested anymore, and I wander over to the altar. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you're wandering away, I trail off with my explanation that I, I lost it to uh, a coconut crab migration. Uh, I was in the wrong place at the wrong <laughs> time, and I... I, I I lost my my hand to the crabs. <laughs> as uh as me and Wilback Willie are f kind of following at a bit of a distance behind Helmut Kielster and towards the altar, I kind of do a robotic whisper toward toward Willie. Admiral Captain Willie, do you think that Helm? Or I mean, do you think anyone? Do you think it would be? Cool. If I got a tentacle, <laughs> I have the capacity for self modification. I think you can have to I, look okay, inside can I, your. Can I roll a perception check to see if I hear this? Yes, you absolutely conversation? can. Okay. <laughs> I got an eight. You got an eight. Unfortunately, you are not able. You can hear that they're whispering, but you can't pick it up. Fuck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, all I'll say about that is you need to look inside yourself and decide if you really do want it, because uh, sometimes the tentacle is not always greener on the other side. Uh, there there are many complications that come with life with a tentacle. Agreed. Performing self-diagnostic. And uh, the like lights that make up uh, Pego's facial display just kind of go dark and Pego gets quiet again and kind of stops moving. All right. As you come upon the altar, Helmut Kielstern, you see scratched into this solid block are a bunch of letters that appear to be not in any proper order that you would recognize, 
but there are spaces between various groupings, almost like these are words. Uh, your uh, piggle, being that you'd be, as we all know, programmed to love. Be you programmed to love in other languages? Please wait. Performing self-diagnostic. <laughs> Is this one of Pego's five love languages? <laughs> self-diagnostics? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Pego's love languages are um, pegging and self-diagnostics and analyzing and healing and the fifth one is still in beta mode <laughs> but it is uh it it is aggression, it is aggression. <laughs> jesus <laughs> hey you liked it so <laughs> yar that'd be true <laughs> there be no denying that okay um can i, I, need I... You... Uh, let's say you need to roll a resilience first nicole before you do anything else. Oh boy, I got a three. Now, as you look over the words, you feel a pressure in your head. A pressure exuding extreme force. And you feel your lips twisting as you're forced to speak the words on the altar. Oh. It sounds demonic like no words you've ever heard before, and your voice doesn't appear to be your own. Uh-oh. The structure shudders. The glass, thick as plate before, shatters and rains down on the outside of the building. You hear a cracking, and you look outside the window, and you see almost like a hole opening in the ocean itself blood pouring in like waterfalls in <laughs> i don't know how you would you're way far away from this <laughs> uh. you see if you look down there what seems to be an endless black hole with the blood pouring into it i stick my leg in it i'm sorry go ahead nicole how much have you had to drink <laughs> 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 At what seems to be a, a pace unnaturally quick, you see the waters, the blood waters, receding around the dock, and that underneath the dock, the, because it is a tooth, <gasps> more and more of it revealing, it appears to be similar to a narwhal tooth, longer than the rest of them. And as you're seeing this happen, the uh, the temple itself begins to crumble and slide and falls into this giant maw that is opened up that all the blood's pouring into. So we're in the temple yeah. and the temple's falling in. Okay. Yeah. And that's uh that's where we're gonna stop today. Oh. So oh boy. Have, and have we we have fallen into it or are about yeah. to fall into it? You are falling into it. And you're in the okay, middle of so self-diagnosis. I... <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah. I was going to do a very thing. clever button where I woke up and said, <laughs> self-diagnostic complete. Did I miss anything good? <laughs> but you kind of headed me off at the pass there, so I guess we'll never get that joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's always next week, Kelly. Next week, I will be at work. Wait, no, I'm not Pego anymore. <laughs> You're not at work. No, the next session. Next session. But yes, that is that is a story for today. You guys have stumbled upon a temple, which has opened up a hole in the earth that all the ocean of blood is pouring into. So you, well, it solves our you, ocean you of blood problem. That I, it's all just kind of. You could say that I am sticking my leg into the hole. <laughs> if you think about yeah, it, along with along, along with, with the rest of your body. Of you. <laughs> That's exactly. even better. All right. I've never been yeah. so fucking turned on in my life, <laughs> fellas. And ungendered robots. And that yeah, is I all mean, I to have be for honest, you folks today. The more I think about it, I'm like, if I go back and start listening to all this, I'm going to be like, no, I probably misgendered myself several times. <laughs> it's usually how it goes. 
Well, you know what? Rules should apply to other people, not to me. So Exactly. <laughs> All right. Do you think we should let Tanner plug his podcast this time? We, we can actually you? let him plug it this time, being that we still have a full I, I five minutes get, for the two hours. I won't get played off by the orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> um, the I mean, hook will come up from the side of the screen and yank you hours, off. But, um, so I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning, but my name is Tanner. And I am half of a podcast called Not Born Under Punches, Beyond the Breakers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Beyond the Breakers, a podcast about shipwrecks, loss, and lessons learned from maritime disasters. Uh, we talk about shipwrecks and shipwreck related things, other types of disasters at sea. We recently started getting into things like oil rigs, that kind of stuff. It's relatively funny when we can uh we, we try to keep it as light as possible but uh by nature of the subject it does it does get kind of heavy sometimes uh but we like to incorporate any other connections we can to media literature music movie kind of thing so give us a listen uh even if you're not particularly into shipwrecks uh, you might find yourself you know adoring our charm and wit with which we present the stories so give us a listen Please, for the love of God. Oh, so your your co-host is is charming and witty. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, I'm this co-hosted by uh, it's co-hosted by Taylor, who is my uh, he he's the knowledgeable one about shipwrecks, and he's my longtime older brother. Uh, so it, it's it's uh, we have a good rapport as hosts. We we get along pretty well. We communicate pretty well. Um, so, yeah, I think that leads to the pretty solid product that we've been able to produce. We're in season three now. And, uh, yeah, we, we've built up a, a pretty decent following uh, of people. Um, we're on Patreon if you want to give us money. We're on Kofi if you want to give us money. Any way you want to give us money is cool, really. Hell yeah. That's it. That's I was about podcast. to say he's the Pego Deer Helm McKillstern, but then you said he's like my older brother, and I was like, oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Are, are you still allowing people to commandeer your show if they write a script for you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyone, <laughs> if you, he hesitated because yeah, he's like, unless it's you. <laughs> absolutely. In which case, go uh, no. We, we, we like to change it up. We, like, we've been having more and more guest hosts on there. Um, we're happy to do whatever. I mean, even if you want to be on the show and you don't want to write a script, you just want to be the person who's reacting to stuff. That's cool. That's an integral part of every podcast. You need the person presenting stuff. You need the person reacting to stuff. Um, but yeah, if there's stories you want to present or stories you want to hear, we're always taking uh, suggestions and requests. We love uh, researching new stuff we've never heard of before. Um, yeah. That's, that's the way it works in Beyond the Breakers world. Excellent. Glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Thank you again for having me on. Um, I feel like I I feel like I wasn't as responsive during the game because my internet kept cutting out, but I think I, I have a fair idea of what was going on. And so Excellent. I'm very excited for next week to see what we do to escape or maybe not escape from this gaping maw. Yeah, I apologize. Those were my tech demons, so. <laughs> they had to go somewhere right <laughs> all right and now uh, we'll just uh we'll we'll play out uh the end credits over uh over pego reading a um you know what i'm not gonna make up an erotic i'm just gonna read one <laughs> i lost track of oh shit where did it go <laughs> you lost track of it <laughs> <laughs> oh no here we go I lost track of how many used me, but I kept an eye out for the pretty blonde one. He was on his knees at a trough, watching his cock in the fresh flowing water. That was the way after it had been in another's backside. You had to clean it before you could put it in a... Born Under Punches is recorded primarily in a Misquit Siwai Scully Kun in the traditional territory of the Nahiyuk, Nakoda, Nitsitapi, Nakawe, Metis, and other nations. Also known as Edmonton, Alberta, in Western Treaty 6 territory. It was presented this week by Nicole McCoy, Kelly Gomo, 
Tana Johnson and Josh Hands. Various social media links for the show and its performers can be found in the episode description. But PUP lives primarily on Discord. Join the official server to discuss the show, vote on the titles of future episodes, and submit your own weird erotica. Our theme song is Mr. Wormsley's Addiction by MC Lars. Other Creative Commons licensed media is used sporadically and is attributed in the episode description. Thanks for listening, and happy trails to you. I need you to get some opium, Nicole, to cure your, your hysteria. Good lord. <laughs> Actually, I can tell you another cure for hysteria that they had back in the day. Good <laughs> That's old how fashioned were invented. vibrator. And speaking of sex toys... Oh, Kelly left, so that, there goes my fucking segue. Fucking <laughs> piece of shit. <laughs> my headphones were still in. I could still hear you. Yeah, but you couldn't talk. <laughs> that was the whole part of the segue. Oh, it's your segue. I'm not talking on your yeah. segue. That'd be rude. Oh, my God. <laughs>